right, welcome everyone to the Davos Fingers podcast, episode two, The Things I Do for Love. Mm -hmm. We have with us today uh, the Davos Fingers team. We've got Scott, myself, uh, we have Matt, and we have Brooke. Hey, and, uh, howdy. Ready to dive in, and uh, we're, go we're going to uh, cover John's first chapter today, uh, Catelyn's second chapter, Arya's first chapter, and uh, Bran's second chapter, and then Tyrion's first chapter. And then uh, if we got some time, we're going to throw in some Davos After Dark in at the end and uh, hopefully spoil some things for some people that want to stick around. Wanted to throw in two, uh, just two, two little notes from last week's podcast. We, uh, we did some thinking about, uh, some reviewing and thinking about what we had done last week, and we just thought that... Uh, Spent a little bit too long summarizing each of the chapters, so we're going to try to do the summaries a little bit quicker this time and get to some more of the meat and analysis, as we thought that was really the strength of last episode, so we're going to try to get to more of that this time. And secondly, I know everyone will be happy to know that I've executed the bird that was flying around my house. It is <laughs> long gone. You will no longer hear the annoying annoying beeping sound uh, from, from, the, uh, from the recesses of my house. So, uh, without further ado... Maddie, I think you're going to take us away. Oh, oh, can I interrupt for one second? Absolutely. Wish you would. Excellent. Excellent. I take great pleasure in interrupting both of you. Yes, Rudely. You Two pieces. One, the uh, guitar solo that you heard opening up this podcast is uh, recorded by and an original recording by none other than our friend Matt here. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for bringing so much talent to the podcast. Really appreciate it. Second oh, note. <laughs> second note. Uh, we're not calling Scott Scabby. We're calling him Scaddy, which is actually a portmanteau that we bestowed upon him when he entered fatherhood. It's a mix between Scott and Daddy. Scaddy, and no one else ever calls me that. But. We'll keep it for now. But I, I had no idea that Scatty came from Daddy. I I did not know that. What? I just liked the name. No, I just liked the name. I came up with it. <laughs> I wonder if I can find that I am conversation. Okay. Interruption over. Thanks very much. Matt, take it away. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea that we were calling him Scatty because of Daddy. I just thought it was cool. So <laughs> Now it's even cooler. And that's how I'd live my life, just in ignorance, ignorant and bliss. Yes, yep, that's who I am. <laughs> Jeez, speaking of people who are clueless, how about Jon Snow, huh? Just kidding, not clueless at all. Uh, the first chapter that we wanted to talk about today was, of course, Jon's, and it's the first time that we really get a look from his point of view. Obviously, we met him before in uh, Bran's first chapter when they found the dire wolves and witnessed the cutting off of poor Gered's uh, noggin. But now we get into a little bit more of John and get to see things from inside his mind, which is an awesome thing to do. So in this first chapter of his, uh, basically all that we saw was the feast of uh, celebrating Robert Baratheon and all his entourage's arrival. And of course, John not being uh, an official part of the family, being a bastard son of Ned's, gets to sit down with kind of the commoners. Uh, he, of course, doesn't like that a whole lot, but makes the most of it. Uh, you can sense a little bit of jealousy coming from him, but he, he tries to kind of uh, swat that away a little bit. Uh, we get to interact with Benjen Stark a little bit, who obviously has a very good relationship with John, and we get to see some of that. Uh, they talk a little bit about the Night's Watch. John ends up kind of rushing out uh, into, the, into the dark night uh, from the feast, where he meets um, Tyrion Lannister. For the first time, we kind of get a look uh, into who Tyrion is. Of course, the youngest son of the Lannisters, uh, Jaime and Cersei, who is the queen, their little brother. He's the They call him the imp because he is a dwarf. And so we kind of get a look into him and we get a nice little conversation between a bastard and a dwarf. So a couple of different things went on in this chapter that we want to kind of discuss and work through tonight. And I think what I would first like to at least get out of the way and talk a little bit about is kind of the, the history of the Night's Watch and what we know about them so far. So we've got a little bit of information, 
but we can see that the Night's Watch is going to be kind of an important thing. I mean, the the whole series opened on the Night's Watch, right? Uh, learning about Waymar Royce and some of those other guys who got killed by the White Walkers. And as we go along, we start to learn a little bit more about these this uh, band of brothers, as it were, up on the wall in the north and who they are. So we find out a couple of things here. We find out that they... They take serious oaths, uh, and some of those oaths include that they will not desert the Night's Watch. We already saw what happened to deserters. We also saw that uh, they don't um, they don't marry and they don't father children, at least not legitimately. And anyone can join the Night's Watch, which I think is interesting, even bastards like Jon Snow. So and murderers and, and murder anyone can. And Scott, on that note, let me pose this to you then. So, uh, what happens when you know when when someone elects to take the black or join the Night's Watch, no matter what they've done before? Well, no matter what they've done before, when when right. when someone elects to join the black and it applies to the bastards too, you keep your name, I suppose, as a bastard. But everything you've done is forgotten. You are now a sworn brother with everyone else. Uh, on that wall in a sworn brotherhood together, united uh, to protect the realm from the wildlings and uh, snarks and grumpkins. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. any any wrongs or crimes that you may have, forget, may have committed in the past is forgotten and forgiven. And uh, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a nice thing. Uh, it's also, in my opinion, it's, it's also, uh, what, what's the phrase, beggars can't be choosers? <laughs> the, the Night's mm-hmm. Watch is always in need of people, and so they're willing to let anything go to get to get people with talents, um, you know, up on the wall. Poachers, for instance, we met the, the guy in that first chapter. Yeah, it seems like at some point they're just looking for bodies, right? Yeah, we met we met that guy in the first chapter that's a poacher, right? And that's like a bad thing, but well, for the Night's Watch, that's a useful fucking skill, right? So, <laughs> so you know, so they let they let a lot slide, uh, you know, because they're in need of bodies. But those are some serious oaths. I mean, you look at um, a similar set of oaths, like the, the Catholic Church and their and their priests. They have a lot behind that, and a lot of of ethical and moral personal choice, and and they can you know turn to their faith to help them keep those oaths. What do the Knights Watch have? Like a lot of cold. It, no kidding, and plus, stack on top of it. A miserable location, uh, certain death, and uh, you never get to wear anything colorful or floral in the spring. Always black. And you would be the only one who worries about that. I did not even consider that. <laughs> Ironically, my wardrobe, 90% black. <laughs> I so, think yeah, it's so, a... Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, we're, we're receiving this information from Benjamin Stark. We only have a... A short introduction to him, but we can ar- we already know he's a Stark, and he is brother to Ned, which probably makes him a good guy, just mm-hmm. just by association, if not familiar relation. Um, so he's a stand up kind of dude, someone who obviously takes his oath seriously, who has risen in the ranks of the Black Brothers. So um, how's everybody else handling this? Uh, no sex, no children, no fun. No floral prints <laughs> is a big question. Yeah. And I, I wonder about Benjamin too. So we saw in that first chapter, uh, the Waymar Royce, right? The, the, the young, a young, young son of a, a noble house, the, the Royce house that's chosen to join the black. And as I think Brooke alluded to kind of a dubious decision to join the, the night's watch for someone with, as much promise as even a young lord that's not going to get to inherit much. Still, you're, mm-hmm. you know, it's an interesting choice. But with Benjen, even more interesting. I mean, uh, I don't know when he... Do you guys... I don't know if we know exactly when he did this. Whether it was... Um, it, was know, it was after um, Robert's Rebellion. So after the war. Uh, uh, you know, um, Ned and Benjen were the only Starks left, right? Exactly uh, what I'm getting their, at. A their weird... mother had died a while ago. Um and then Rickard and the dad and Brandon, the oldest brother, uh, died at the hands of King Ares at the same time. And then, of course, Lyanna died as well. And and so uh, Benjen remained at Winterfell 
to at while Ned went off and fought because as we know and as they've said in these chapters there always needs to be a Stark at Winterfell so Benjen yeah. remained behind and watched Winterfell and then as soon as he get got back apparently as soon as Eddard got back is when uh, is when Benjen uh, took the black so exactly what I mean a weird choice yeah exactly you're it basically is. at that point I mean you're you're basically there, there's not a ton of there's not a ton of heirs around. You know, mm-hmm. and not a ton of Starks around. It seemed like a weird choice to me. Also, time of prosperity. Robert's taking the throne, yes. and it's yeah. a yeah, it's summer, and it's, it's a good time to be a Stark, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting yeah. choice, and I, I don't know more about it than that. Uh, you know they don't they don't they don't give you much on Benj in this way. Yeah, it's really interesting because, and I mean, what is you get this. When I first read, I thought the, was reading that first prologue chapter. I thought, you know, the Night's Watch is super cool, and then you know, you you get to Benjen, and you're like, yeah, it's still pretty cool. But then you learn everyone else that's taken the black, and they're rapists and murderers and thieves and all of that. And it's like, are these guys really that cool? And uh, it's it's kind of a a fun funny thing to think about that all that's really protecting the South from these White Walkers, these terrible creatures, is a big huge wall. Others, manned Matt, by others. excuse me others <laughs> not white walkers that's right white walkers is the hbo name for them and all that stands between them is 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 a big wall and a bunch of rapists and and poachers and stuff and oh, <laughs> and but, oh no see matt you're doing the same thing that we do to modern like to our universe's prisoners and dehumanizing them and right. giving them identities that is only their crimes they've been absolved like they are exactly. they are they are black <laughs> I don't like that I'm catching you on this. <laughs> I think I think he was about to make the point is that okay. the, the rest of the the rest of the world feels that way about these guys, but mm-hmm. they really are ready to step up. But maybe he wasn't going there. No, I, I was, and and it, what I'm trying what I'm trying to get at, and and you did, Brooke, and I don't fault you for that at all. Is uh, is we do get a certain sense of humanity, and and it's something that. George R. R. Martin does brilliantly is you get very human characters. You they're not just rapists and and thieves and stuff like that. They're people. And you get someone again like Raymar Royce, Waymar Royce, who was a kind of a D-bag, but he was still ready to to def, you know uh, do his duty uh, when surrounded by all these others. And, and that's how a lot of those, a lot of these, uh, members of the night's watch are. I would read um, the crap out of a novel that was just the black brothers. Yes. Night's Wouldn't watch. that be cool? Yes. Yeah. Spin off Side just, books. Yeah. Just Except I don't trust anyone to watch. handle it the right way. Other than that, I would read them. <laughs> I would read anything written by, by Bentham. Oh, well, you want Bentham to write them? Yes, I do. <laughs> Bentham said you wanted to read them. <laughs> maybe that qualifies her best to write them uh i'm far too lazy let's start a letter campaign to george i think he'd be on it no i think he's well, looking for any sort of anything but the next any... novel. <laughs> no, know, he's right? not, are you kidding he's me? not to george touch anything not else shiny yeah. objects distracting him i know it's like he seeks out procrastination this would be perfect he'd be like oh good idea guys <laughs> um so that's the night's watch um any final thoughts you guys wanted to make on the Night's Watch? I think we've covered them. I think there's going to be a lot more to talk about when we get to meet them. Totally. I'm excited. <laughs> so let's let's focus in on John a little bit and talk about just what it means to be uh, a bastard in this world that George R. R. Martin has created. Um, you know, we get all these things that John's adamant uh, – insistence that he will never have children um you know he had to learn to notice things is one thing that it points out in the chapter um he's not sitting with the rest of his family at at this big feast you know what is it with bastards in westeros and and why are they looked upon the way they are holy cow it's 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 his entire definition of being everything is seen through the lens of him being a bastard it has got to be exhausting and at the same time you also get the sense that he's in some ways extremely grateful that he has ned like like he he hates that he sees the world through this lens of being a bastard but at the same time he wouldn't trade it for the world because then ned wouldn't be his dad right mm. you know it's like this 
It's like this extreme dichotomy in his being that that's fighting all the time, right? Extreme pride in in having the blood he has, but also this this shame and and you know self-deprecation at being a bastard all the time, right? Mhm. That's really uh, tender, Scott. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like you relate to Jon Snow. Uh you brought in, in up an interesting point, Matt, in that he made quite a fuss and a little bit of a scene during the feast, um, (laughs) shouting that he would never father children. He would never father a bastard in turn, which, uh, I guess points to the, the, the logic that if your last name is snow, you can only pass on the last name of snow. Like it's, (laughs) it's, it's not even something your children can get out of, which is like, twice as damning it's crazy um oh, yeah you know a lot of times you you want to give the best to your children and even if you're a failure you can at least set your children up for some sort of success and and that's not even an option available yeah it's not even a you know you you spend hours uh making them hit balls in the backyard so they can be a pro <laughs> baseball player what uh, your kids are doing right now <laughs> Are you kidding? They're yeah, playing the piano <laughs> until their fingers bleed. <laughs> no, but that option isn't even available to to these poor children of bastards. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, it, that, that's exactly to my point. I've actually heard this said before. I'm trying to think who it was. Um, some comedian, uh, I say N because it's a woman comedian. Oh, she had her own, oh, Sarah Silverman. She was on like a talk show or something. And I read an article on it where she gave the reason for never having children as she has heredit or uh, presumably hereditary mental um, uh, diseases that she just doesn't want to pass on. Uh, she doesn't feel like her children deserve that. And I, I would say a lot of people would be willing to take that risk, um, hoping that, you know, children will receive treatment. They'll, they'll have uh, prior knowledge of the ailment or, or whatever you know, mental condition it is. And then they can, you know, be um, proactive about it. Like it, it, w- it would not stop them from having children, but she's pretty absolute in it. And it sounds to me like Jon Snow is like not even going to take the chance. Not even never, never going to put any 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 child of mine in this position. And so, yeah, Night's Watch makes a lot of sense to him, even though he is only fourteen. You know that really Silverman interesting, thing, really that, interesting point. Yeah, that Silverman thing really, uh, really hits home for me. I, I had the same the same dilemma um, trying to convince my wife that we should not have kids because I knew they would be afflicted with my nerdiness. <laughs> And their obsession for Star Wars. The world Wars. is a better place. And then your you wife named your son to. Lucas. And then I named my son Luke. Wow. Uh, yep. Thank heavens for the Thompsons. Indeed. Uh, so Viva with, Leonard. With that, then Brooke, I, that's a beautiful point you just made. Um, what does that tell us then about? about John's personality, you know, having that sort of foresight and, and forethought and he's living at a disadvantage all of the time. And it would be really easy to just kind of fall into some sort of, uh, just extreme apathy. But what does that tell us, you know, about who John is and and how his mind works? Yeah. He is mature beyond his years, right? (laughs) He is mature and far seeing and wise beyond his years is my opinion. Well, he's also grown up side by side with Rob, who has had all of the privileges denied to him, but they get along really well. They're close as full blood brothers. And I imagine that has had a lot of influence on him. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about Tyrion, and then we'll be done with this chapter, because I think it's really interesting to note uh, his entrance and subsequent conversation with uh, John talking about uh, John never forgetting who he is and, you know, sort of wearing that label of bastard with a certain amount of pride and talking about how, you know, not all bastards need to be dwarves, even though all dwarves are bastards. Uh, what do you take from the counsel that Tyrion gave to, to John outside on that, that cold night in Winterfell? No, I've got nothing, Scad. <laughs> so you were on a roll. Well, I, I think he does something interesting because so so let's let's first point out neither of these guys have it as bad as it could be. They're both growing up, living a reasonably sweet life in a noble house with lots of money and all their base needs taken care of. Um, 
you know, they're, <laughs> but they, they both have a, a very, uh, sor feel sorry for me attitude, which is somewhat deserved. We've already talked about the plight of the bastard and how hard that is. Uh, we, we haven't yet heard much from Tyrion about what it means to be a dwarf in this society, but it's rough. We'll just, we'll just lay it at your feet like that. It's rough. But at the same time, I think Tyrion's talking to Jon and being like, look, Dick, you think you got it bad? Look at me. Like, stop, stop feeling so sorry for yourself and, you know, know exactly what you are and live it and own it and be proud of it, but don't let anyone knock you down for it. Take it, mm -hmm. take that away from them, and mm -hmm. you know you don't have it as bad as maybe you think you do. That that's part of what I think he was given given to. And him. even if you do, still own it and 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 make something of yourself. You yeah, know? do what you can. Yeah. Good point. But we Excellent see point. we see a lot of people in this series that have it a lot worse than these two dudes. Even the, even though Martin makes us feel for them very much, and and we should. And you know what? I think that I think that you're right, like on the money on that one, Scott. And in a chapter that we're going to be discussing later in this particular episode, Arya, um, John's younger half sister, proclaims that it's not fair, and mm -hmm. uh, John says, "Yeah, nothing's fair." Yeah. So I think he's already starting to, yeah, <laughs> to just settle into that acceptance, and uh, <laughs> he's a quick learner. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. But one thing Tyrion has going for him that we can't forget is that is his tremendous acrobatic skills. What the heck? Let's not, let's not forget that he did like some flippy handspringy thing off the uh, arch or whatever. I, I would say off. I'm excited to see more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like directly in the next Tyrion chapter, it's talking about him hobbling around up and down stairs. His joints and... aching. It's yeah. because he's been doing so many acrobat yes. acrobatics, you guys. Oh, yes. Like, he's sore. It's the cold. Uh, oh, I should have stopped bones. before I jumped off of that thing. Major oh. editing fail. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's enough of John. Uh, great chapter. Gave us a lot of insight, not only into kind of the North and the Night's Watch and everything, but also into two very key characters, mostly John and a little bit of Tyrion as well. Uh, the next chapter was Catelyn's second chapter. We're already getting her uh, a second look at uh, in Catelyn's mind, and Scatty read that with a certain amount of um, care, and uh, we're going to hit it over to him now. Yeah, I, I took as much care as I could. Uh, so this is a great chapter. Um, this is while 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 some of the chapters you know in, in this book are, are very character driven, and some of them are very plot driven. Some of them are like this and do both. Oh, and it's a gem. It's it's a great chapter. Uh, what you got is Ned and Cat post coital. They're uh, in the room. Ned's shaking the dust off. Open up the opening up the the window, <laughs> and uh, Catelyn's Catelyn's freezing freezing her ass off in bed. And uh, they're just they're about to decide whether Ned's going to stay uh, in Winterfell Winterfell or go and accept Triple B's offer to uh to be his hand in King's Landing while he rules. But they're surprised with a visit from Maester Lewin. We'll talk a little bit more about Maesters later. But uh Maester has been has been given a uh, an anonymous gift laid at his door uh addressed to uh addressed to Catelyn. And so he brings it. It it ends up being from Lysa. There's a hidden message uh within that gift uh that Catelyn decrypts and it basically tells her that the Lannisters and specifically the Queen are behind John Aaron's murder. And that is a catalyst for them that they decide Ned must go. And he must figure out what's going on down there and who did it and why and, you know, what the motivations are. Uh, they decide that uh, he'll take with him Sansa, Arya, and Bran, and he's going to leave Rob to rule and, well, learn how to rule from, from Catelyn and Maester Lew uh, Lewin. Uh, and they're also going to leave Rickon behind because he's, he's a tiny little guy. And uh, the conflict really becomes about John and whether where he's going to go, and uh, it it comes to the Kate, Catelyn doesn't want him to stay. Ned can't take him with him because he knows that a bastard at court won't won't go well. And uh, Maester Lewin comes in, saves the day, and says, "Hey, uh, John wants to join the Night's Watch, so maybe we just let him do that." And uh, lastly, there's also a lot of interesting stuff in there about. Uh, Catelyn, when she found out uh, about 
about Jon Snow the Bastard being born uh, and trying to figure out who the mother is and how she heard it and why. Some really interesting stuff in there character-wise for her and and uh, her relationship with Ned. So that's the summary. In a, that's the chapter summary in a nutshell there. Um, so a, f- a few things. I want to talk a little bit about the Maesters first just to get that out of the way. Um, and guys, just jump in wherever. But, uh, you know, the Maesters are an order of learned, educated men in various disciplines. And they come from, they all go to one central location in Old Town, uh, Sakensus Mapas. If you, if you get out your maps, uh, you can look in the back and toward the very bottom left corner of the map, you'll see a, a town called Old Town. And that's where they're all, uh, they're all trained up. And, uh, those maesters, uh, they, they basically study all sorts of fields uh, of, of medicine and science and history and warfare and, and anything you can imagine. And when they learn enough stuff, they basically get assigned out to be the advisors to the noble houses of Westeros. And so each major house, uh, well, each, each noble house of any kind has a maester that is loyal to the realm and not supposedly loyal to their own politics or their own their own house or anything like that, but loyal to the realm itself by getting this training. And um, a lot of interesting characters uh, in the book that are maesters um, and some that are training to become maesters. And uh, you'll see a lot more of them, and and they all have different kind of specialties and and different areas of knowledge that they specialize in and stuff. So that's what a maester is. You'll see them a lot. Um, They also, one of the main things they do is they manage the ravens, which you'll learn are the, the key ways that you can send information from house to house is through Raven. You, you tie a little note to their leg and they fly off and they know they've been trained by the maesters to fly to different locations. And so, um, that's, they're, they're that's kind, maesters. Kind of, go ahead. They're kind of like the family doctor too. Yeah. As absolutely. well as the, like the school teacher, they yep. teach all the kids. They're kind of really the jack of all trades. I, I think of how long we spend in school just to learn about one thing, one emphasis and one major, and these guys are have to learn everything. Just gonna say they're kind of like those those jerk perpetual students, but they actually are useful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, rereading this chapter reminded me that uh, when Lewin is described, um, so every time they master some sort of uh, I don't know, area discipline, they get. Discipline. There you go. They get a link for a chain worn around their neck that is of a different metal representative of that discipline. But apparently the chain is is tight around their neck. It's not like mm-hmm. a long drooping chain. It's I, I suppose it's it's um, uh, um, incentive to gain more discipline so that the the chain isn't so tight around your neck. I don't yeah. know. But it sounds super uncomfortable, and it is not what you would automatically picture. I'm just wondering if there is a deeper motivation for having it so tight around their neck, like a reminder of their of their job. Yeah, it's kind of a constant reminder, right? And, and there's I wonder a, if it's that, yeah. I think there's a sweet spot in there, too, somewhere, because the more change you get, the heavier it is that it's hanging from your neck, too. Mm. So there's got to be some sort of sweet spot. Like, I think I'm smart enough now. <laughs> It's not choking me anymore, but it's getting it's, a little heavy. I'll yeah, stop. Yeah, it's loose enough, but not quite heavy enough to have yeah. my head to be dragging along the floor. I like the way walk. you put that, Brooke. It, it's it's kind of like a constant reminder to them of what they are and, and who their responsibility is to and, and all right. of that. Yeah, they really do fill in the chinks of a lot of of roles that are missing in this world. Like, like, like you mentioned, physician or family doctor, or just general knowledge guy. They're kind of like... Wikipedia's <laughs> for, for for every house. That is perfect. That yeah. is absolutely perfect. They are the internet for every house of Westeros. <laughs> they, they totally are. They, even the ravens are kind of like their network. <laughs> right. Oh, clever. The ravens oh, are email. Yeah. We cracked that code, guys. <laughs> we do not work for a technology company. <laughs> uh. All right. So. Uh, Next, I kind of wanted to, wanted to just talk about Catelyn in general. It's her chapter, and I think she shines in it. Um, you know, you, you see one of the things that we called to uh, call attention to in the last episode. If you haven't watched it, go check out episode one or listen to it. Go check out episode one. 
DavosFingers.com. And uh, one of the things we pointed out in that first episode is that the the relationship between Circe and 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 uh, Big Bob Baratheon, uh, the king and queen of of this fair country, it's there's no respect. There doesn't seem to be much love. Um, you know, you, you don't you don't believe them as a happy couple at all, and I don't think you're meant to. And you know, this scene, you see a very tender, a, a very tender, respectful relationship. Um, you know, and and she's, she, I think Catelyn is, I think Catelyn is what every what every lord in Westeros should should hope to should hope for. She's a very loving and nurturing mother. She is wise. She sees she's she's the one that that uh, I think Lewin did too. But she sees the meaning of receiving the lens in the gift that a lens is a device to see and that they should look further into the gift. And, uh, you know, she's, she can, she can uncover that riddle. Um, she gives good counsel. She stands up for herself when it comes to John. So she's not just, you know, some, some woman doing what she's told, you know, like, like, like some of the women in this book you'll find out are, um, you know, so I think she's, she's just a very dynamic, powerful, in, enriched character. And I, I, I wonder if Ned knows what he has and how lucky he is. Yeah, I imagine he doesn't show affection very well. He's kind of more the the strong and silent type. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a, in a book where you know we talked about in Danny's chapter last week how how women are often treated in this in this culture and everything they're kind of the the baby makers and they're, they're you know they're used in negotiations to unite houses and stuff. You know, marry one of my daughters. You know, they're bargaining chips in some cases. I hate to just generalize them like that, but uh, it helps Catelyn even stand out even more that, you know, she's not just the mother of Eddard Stark's children. She's not just producing Eddard's heirs. She's a she's a real partner in all of this, you know? She's if Eddard's A in in Winterfell, she's one, you know, A and one, they, they seem to to work together and and even if Ned doesn't uh you know, he may not realize exactly what he has, I don't know. But I think he he definitely respects her as as an equal partner, and and that's yeah. really cool to see, especially in a marriage that was never supposed to happen, right? Yeah, right. Uh, Catelyn was betrothed to um, Brandon. Brandon, Ned's older brother, and when uh, Brandon was killed by King Aerys, um, Ned married Catelyn out of duty. It was it was a marriage of of duty, and they still yeah. ended up. Um, uh, in the situation there now, which is a very functional and, and a family and, and a very working marriage that's that's actually quite good. So. Yeah, they're both After very five successful. kids, six kids, whatever, five kids, the magic is still there, you know, obviously. <laughs> Scott, I love the way that you described her. Um, oftentimes, women will advocate for strong female characters in media and TV shows and movies and books. But the interpretation of a strong female character by many is a female who just acts like a man. When in truth, uh, one could argue, and I'm not like, this is not an original thought. This is all over the internet feminism airwaves. But what we're actually looking for is a woman of substance, of complexity, um, of, you know, you can be strong and still cry. You can be strong and still make bad decisions. You can be strong and still be reliant on your husband. But honestly, I think we should stop asking for strong female characters and just start asking for interesting female characters. Not How about just real baby ones? Makers. How about real ones? Yeah. Every time that, so we could, we could get derailed on this conversation for a long ass time. No uh, kidding. My sister's educated me well on this topic, but, <laughs> um, you know, all, all so I do some acting on the side, and and all I'm ever really looking for is interesting characters to play. And I, I find that in media with with female characters, what you're frequently given is a role. They're here to fulfill a purpose. Like they're here to drive the plot along in some way. Right. I mean, the the most common one obviously is the the romantic interest, right? That just drives the male character along, which is horrible. The but worst. It's the worst. But. But all you really need are real characters, characters mm-hmm. that if you set them aside and just look at their story and say, what are their motivations for acting this way? Are they real? Mm-hmm. Do they exist? Are they thought out? 
that's all you really that's it's really the only question you need to be asking about your characters female or otherwise <laughs> like do they make sense are they making <laughs> rational choices and do they have something that drives them right that's Definitely. really all there is to it and Catelyn yeah, certainly sure. does yeah she's a fantastic example of that and and not to belabor this point but i would argue that um having uh, just looking for real women characters is not even good enough because a lot of real women don't realize that they have the right um, to be interesting. A lot of them fall into these same roles. Like it's scary. They just don't know that there are other options out there. You don't have to go through the motions. There's a lot of men that fall under that that trap too. Yeah, people. <laughs> I'll I'll stop being sexist just for you. White privileged males. Hey. You're welcome. <laughs> American too. Don't forget that. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Upper middle class white American privileged males. I'll stop. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I just want to point out that all feminist really means is that you believe that women and men are equal. And so I, I, I hate that word because I think people have a negative connotation for it. Anyway, let's let's move on. So one thing I wanted to add about the relationship. Uh, so we've we talked about how great Catelyn is and, and how, how great their relationship is and, and how give and take it is. And they're talking to each other as equals and making decisions together. And they're both in this game together. And there is a wedge hmm. that you can that just, it just like every time a certain three letter name gets dropped, it just wedges itself straight through their relationship. And, Catelyn's resentful and Ned is 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 short with her and it just it just gets ugly. And that three, letter, that, that three letter name is John, of course. And we see that in this chapter. And I don't know what you guys if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about that. Oh, more more cement for her um realness for sure. She is a loving and um dedicated mother, but Man, does she ever resent the fact that Ned has embraced his bastard child as one of his own. She even said that she could get over him just fathering a bastard mm -hmm. and maybe just leaving the bastard with the mother wherever she was. Um, but he, she can't get over him bringing the boy home and raising him in their house and stuff like that. More than, more than she could get over it. She expected it. Mm -hmm. She, she she's like this men have needs. And when they're out on the war campaign for a year at a time, I expect him that he's going to have to do that. But if, if oh. he happens to father someone, he needs to leave them behind. Right? Looks like, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I read that with like, my you face almost froze into the gag face. It was, it was gagging for so long. Well, they've been married for such a short time, right? They'd only yes. been married for a short time before uh, Ned went off to war. Uh, she finds out she's pregnant with um, with Rob. And, you know, there's no way to, like, send selfies of her belly off to Ned and be like, Hey, but look, look, what, look we're having a baby and stuff. And... She's so yeah. happy probably to share this new child with Ro with Ned. And, and, of course, Rob's born before Ned returns. And she's like, I'm so excited. I, he gets to meet his little baby boy. Well, he's already got one. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that would be pretty devastating for a first-time mother. Well, I, that, I, I, I got the impression that they were together for a night. The wedding happened. They consummated. And he left. And yeah. it, it was a very short time. Yeah. That seed quickened. Ned. Hey, do you think Ned ever told anybody we're pregnant? <laughs> we're pregnant. I don't think he did. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. I mean, Matt's whole Matt's whole statement there was that Ned didn't know that he got back and he had a son and he was, it was right. a surprise. It's possible that they sent ravens around and he knew. Mm. Um, but 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 we but we don't know that we don't we don't know either way. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can kind of understand the resentment on a certain level, and and it would be very tough to deal with. She's like, you know, I married you out of duty, and I gave up all this, and da 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 da, da and you still bring home this bastard kid. Uh, turning it around to Ned, why do you think he's so short in talking about it? Is it just because he knows, oh, this is going to start a fight. I don't want to do this. So I just, just shut up. Just shut up. You know, or, you know, what's is it because he feels shame because he is a man of such honor and he's fathered this bastard and he really just doesn't want to talk about it. But then why would he bring him home in the first place? I don't know. So uh, 
I, I think it does have to do with honor. Uh, I, I think he's, I think he is embarrassed by it. It's not an action that he normally takes. Um, you know, just sleeping around and and satisfying his urges. I bet Brooks' face is back stuck in that position again. Um, oh. But uh, so I, I think part I'm of lucky. it, I think part of it is honor. Um, but I, I think part of it too is is it's just it's just kind of his nature not to want to talk about uncomfortable things. He's he is he has so many positive qualities, right? And he's a great guy, but. Like, why belabor this? I don't want to talk about this. Like, I got other important things to worry about. Like, let's move on. This I is what it, it is, that, and, and yeah. I said that, and let's move on. I think he's just short. I think he'd be short for other other similar things, too. You didn't go to my sister's wedding! Well, you know what? I had other things I had to do. Let's drop it. Like, I just think that's the way he is. He's very, he's very pragmatic that way, and it's the way he views it. Which lends itself to very good... Um, well, I think in a sense, uh, leadership skills. He is a decisive leader, and when he, you know, when he gets his mind on something, he's going to do it, and, and that's a pretty good quality to have. But I, I, I don't think he's perfect. I mean, a lot of people mm. hold Eddard up as this this saint, and I, I don't think so. I mean, I think he has flaws, and I, know, think I think he think this, would be uncomfortable with being called that. Yeah, he probably would. Holier than thou. Uh, so, so the last thing in, the, in this chapter, really, that that. Uh, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about characters, but they make a, a, a pretty substantial choice in this chapter that Ned's going. And, you know, I read that. I'm like, no, the first time, like, don't <laughs> go. You just heard that, you know, these people are, they're out for blood. And now you just want to go and, and do this. Like maybe stay where it's safe. And, uh, so I don't know. I, I, did you guys agree with the decision or. I agree that with, uh, Caitlin, that, there's no way you can turn down the the king. Uh, exactly. Ned seems Ned seems convinced that Robert is still the boy that he grew up with. That Robert would get over it within a week and they'd be back to slapping each other on the back and hunting together. But Caitlin and I'm glad that he has her for counsel. Wisely advises him that Robert is no longer you know the the boy that he knew. He is a king, a long established king, and um a bit of an embittered king because of all of the crap he's had to put up with uh, via his in-laws. So she says, um, no, you have to go because to refuse would be um, absolutely ridiculous. And more importantly, might be seen as treasonous. Um, like Ned has uh, designs on the throne. So, so, so you think he had to go before the letter? So, uh, after, oh yeah, for so, sure. So, after the letter, did you change your mind at all? I don't even know why he asked for more time to think about it. Or, <laughs> like, honestly, the king asks you to be the king's hand. The king drags his entire entourage for a month up to the cold north, uh, including his his uh, rashy wife. Then, and knowing that his wife won't like it at all. Yeah. And, and of course, in earlier chapters, they had already um, speculated that Robert was coming up for more than just a visit. I think that Ned was fooling himself. It, it always had to happen. But the letter certainly was, was the kick in the can. Do you think Ned and, and Catelyn, to a gr- degree, saw what kind of shape Robert was in physically, emotionally? I mean, he's this drunk, just going downhill fast type of guy do you my think kind of guy, yep. really yeah my kind too <laughs> on the weekends anyways Shelty's uh, kind of guy too <laughs> yes, <indeed. laughs> that's mrs thompson <clears throat> uh do you think there was a sense of of duty on ned's part to his his country or the kingdom and, and that i gotta go try to fix this because robert and his wife's family are running this place into the ground or do you think that didn't even play a part in it oh good question in other words was he was he driven by ulterior motives or, or not ulterior motives but uh altruistic purposes of wanting to help the, Honest- the kingdom mm-hmm. honestly from his discussions with catelyn and from what we've seen of ned his love for the North and his family far outweighs any responsibility he feels for um, helping Robert 
dig himself out of the hole that he's in. And because he needs time to think about the offer and hesitates, I think he's, he's just, uh, yeah, like deluding himself or, 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 or avoiding the harsh truth that, Yes, the Robert that Robert and the kingdom need Ned to clean up the mess that the Lannisters have made. I would agree. Yeah, I think I agree. I think yeah, I think the, he's doing it out of duty. Um, and you guys uh, have been saying duty a lot, and all I'm picturing is D O O D Y. Duty. Disgusting. <laughs> wow. Uh, but episode you know, one was so strong, and listen to us. Our VH1 storytellers, you know, <laughs> stories already being written. <laughs> this is where it started. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, just one f- final thing, maybe, and I actually just forgot what it was, so never mind. Well, that's good, because it's far Edit. past time we should move on yeah. to Arya. Yep. Great. So our first introduction to Arya, she is the youngest daughter of Ned and Catelyn. She's a Stark. Uh, we open up with her and her sister Sansa, a Sansa's best friend, uh, daughter of another person who lives in Winterfell, and the Princess Marcella. How do you guys pronounce her name? Marcella. That was awesome. Way. We agree. Win Marcella. They're all doing um, needlepoint cross stitch sewing under the supervision of a septon, or pardon me, septa which is, uh, I would say, probably an equivalent of a nun. So a religious woman who uh, would sort of, of be seven, a Catholic. Right? Yeah, yeah, a Catholic nunny in her role as an educator. And uh, yeah, Arya, not into that. Bit of a tomboy, sasses the septa, books it out of there, goes down to the courtyard where two things of note happen. Or we should make note of two things. One, Jon Snow is not participating in the um, like mock uh, sword fighting training that the other boys are doing. So Rob and um, the young princes, he is watching. Um, and Arya asks him why he's not doing that and because bastards are not invited. So again, bring out the bastard. Hey, Jon Snow, how are you doing this morning? I'm a bastard always comes up it's brutal (laughs) Um, i'm I'm a bastard (laughs) that's what it feels like um but we get it and obviously we're supposed to be getting it so second thing of note rob and joffrey um have uh, we don't actually see them uh mock fighting training however joffrey challenges rob once again with a real sword not just like a training wooden sword and uh, the training master says, no way. You guys are way too young. It's dangerous. It's not going to happen. Uh, Rob and Joffrey, or Rob, I believe, tries to convince him to at least uh, let them have a try with blunted swords. And uh, so uh, Joffrey sees them being denied using real swords as a way to get out of having his ass handed to him again by Rob. Uh, which we understand happened in their last match um, as observed by Jon Snow. And it, they end up throwing some taunts at each other, a couple of mean slurs. And we observe that Rob and Joffrey are probably never going to get along to the point that, you know, of, of friendship that Robert and Ned have. Um, their sons are certainly not seeing eye to eye or, and uh, have not found any sort of reason to be close, probably because Joffrey's a little dick. Anyways, uh, closes out the chapter with Arya remarking that she'd much rather be doing uh, sword work than needlework, and that it's just not fair. And this is where John says, well, nothing's fair, so suck it up. And that is our first introduction to the little tomboy Arya. I just wanted to throw in one little one little nugget that you you didn't put in your summary because it's not important, but it it did it did give me a smile because it reminded me of something from my youth. The uh, the way they describe Tom and, and Bran being all bundled up and <laughs> in their armor and like they're like rolling around like the well, Tom gets knocked down and he like can't get up. And I I just remember a Christmas story. Randy lay there like a slug. It was his only defense. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that oh, one. Oh, should. Brooke. And they haven't come out with it in Canada. Maybe not. It's been Maybe like 30 year. years, and it's still not. 
Oh yeah, no, we won't have that. For a few you guys are just getting like Casablanca, to right? You and send you a link so you can see that scene. Yeah. Okay, great. sounds good. Um, yeah, super cute and uh, interesting that they have them training to uh, fight with lethal weapons so young. But uh, I guess that's the way it goes. Either uh, you either get in there earlier, you lose out later. Well, they can't really like sit and play video games, right? They, Touche. They could. They could have them so. They could sew or they could go out and fight in the yard. Those are your choices. <laughs> See, the <laughs> feminism stink is still hovering over our conversation. <laughs> they could be doing needlework. <laughs> it's a viable option. They, they could be learning from the maester, which uh, the, I think they do a, quite a bit of. <clears throat> Not as much fun as hitting each other with sticks. Indeed. Admittedly, a lot of fun. Uh, some very interesting points of note. I think Arya is a great character. I think she's, uh, again, another female character who is complex and interesting and um, neither completely good or completely bad. She's not flat. She doesn't fulfill, you know, a role of just another ch child of the Starks, you know, to fill out the, uh, the five hand there. She has a lot of personality and um, she does note during her conversation with John that herself and John are the only ones who really have the look of the Norse. So they're the only ones who resemble their father. They both have dark brown hair and uh, dark gray eyes. Well, the rest of the children, Rob, Sansa, Bran, and Rickon, take more after Caitlin um, and um, her people of Riverrun. Um, with auburn hair and lighter eyes. And so she feels more of an affiliation with John because they do look alike. And uh, she also has been teased in her youth because she has a long face. She gets called Arya Horseface. She feels like like a mouthful for kids to be taunting. Like, does it rhyme? Like, come on, guys, get, get creative. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you really want to hurt a child, you got to get creative. And so uh, she... Uh, she is very aware that she is not pretty and perfect like her sister Sansa. She's not gentle in her speech or um, uh, really good at, at womanly pursuits, if you will, like like needlework and art. She is. <laughs> but, but she uh, does note that Sansa should never be expected to run a household because she has no head for figures. And presumably Arya can do math real good. But not language. Yeah, well, language, not so much. Um, so uh, she is, is, is very self-aware or has been made aware by her siblings that she is different. And um, I wouldn't say that she's quite ready to embrace it. She obviously has a lot of jealousy for Sansa, even though she probably wouldn't recognize it as jealousy. But she obviously looks up to and admires her sister, but mm -hmm. understands that she's not naturally gifted with what Sansa has. So uh, she's got to, she's got to um, make her mark some other way. And, and she does that by uh, being a little rapscallion. And how awesome is she? There's a reference in the text there about how Septim Ordain mentions something about her skills being more suited to be a blacksmith. Oh, and, uh, and she, as she's running out from the, the little morning lesson of sewing, she yells something about having to uh, having to go shoe a horse. Like just throws it right back in her face. She's just got a little bit of a little bit of that an example of that rapscallion mentality you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Also ties into the horse face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's making more sense now. Reach. Oh, I for I forgot to mention the chapter actually ends with. Uh, Arya coming off of the courtyard where they're doing the sword fighting training and uh, the Septa has found her and the Septa has her mother. And it sounds like Arya has some fear of her mother. So uh, she might be getting in trouble. Yeah, I read that and I, I was like, is she really going to get in trouble? Is, is it like, is it like a Arya, you need to be better. Or is it like <laughs> a, you know, no dinner for a week kind of thing, you know, like, how much trouble is she really getting in, I wonder? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is Catelyn a stern mother, do you think? Well, in the Bran chapter, which we're going to be covering, uh, she's pretty out of it that Bran not go climbing around the grounds. And, and then he does it anyway. Up, and Yeah, ends up losing, probably because she can't follow through on threats. So I would say she is not a stern mother. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think she believes in the boundaries and stuff, but uh, whether it's just not being able to follow through or maybe it is a higher sense of wanting her children to develop in their own way, I don't know. But <laughs> she ends up kind of just letting things go, it seems. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so again... I love me some Aria, and I really love her relationship with John. Matt, you pulled out a really good quote. Um, John says to Aria, girls get the sigils, but not the swords. Bastards get the swords, but not the sigils. So John really empathizes with Aria's feeling of it's not fair, and it's not fair that she can't uh, wield a sword and is, is left with needlework instead as a pastime because he's denied a lot of stuff too. So that's that's another wavelength in which they can connect. And uh, I love that they have each other. And I love that um, when they are upstairs doing needlework with the septa, um, just, you know, gossiping and talking, John comes up in conversation and Sansa immediately, (laughs) Oh, John. Yes. Our bastard brother. (laughs) Right. Yeah. John, pass the salt, you bastard. <laughs> Never miss an opportunity to bring it up. But uh, Arya, I believe, defends him and says, our Jumps brother. Just his defense, our brother. Yeah, He's our brother. Just our brother. Yeah. He's our brother. So, very strong relationship there. And I'm glad that they have each other because they are both a little bit of the outsiders, both physically in appearance and, and because of their respective roles. <clears throat> we also, uh, in this chapter, get a first real look at Joffrey. And you Here have, we uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Matt, uh, you have called him a little shit in our notes. I was quoting asked, John. Mm-hmm, does he have any redeeming qualities? Um, very interesting to note that on his jacket that he's wearing while he's training. Um, so he is a Batharian. He is the son of Robert Batharian, the king but he has blonde hair and green eyes and hangs out a lot with his uncle and his mother. You, you almost get the impression that he is a little more Lannister than, than big Bobby B. Um, and that is um, sort of like proven by the fact that the jacket that he's wearing during the training is a split sigil, a sigil. I keep on saying sigil and I apologize. It's that is just that's just me being uneducated. Sigil. Split down the middle. One half is the crown stag, which is the sigil of the Bartharian house, and the other half is a lion, which is Lannister. And I would imagine if you are of the royal house, you should be pretty proud of that house and not willing to modify the sigil at all. But yeah. uh you, you, you gotta imagine there's a lot of influence there from the Lannister side for, for him to be wearing that proudly, especially yeah. the Starks. There's two interesting things about that to me. First, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a, a huge sample size for this yet. We know, we know that the Starks uh, identify with the wolf, the, the dire wolf. We see now Joff identifies with both. Um, you know, we don't have much example. We don't know how weird this is yet. Um, but but I think I think you mentioned the, the good point about look he's the king maybe you should stick with that one <laughs> you know like maybe the maybe the stag is enough um, but I, but I think it also it also maybe hints at something with Joffrey that he's getting he's getting hearing things from both sides he's hearing things in both of his ears right he's he's maybe being fought over a little bit for control by his mother and his father for influence right and he's. You know, okay, I'll put both of them on there, maybe, right? I don't know. Okay, both of them go on, right? And there's there's some mm-hmm. conflict there, which we've mentioned before about about Robert Baratheon and and Cersei Lannister that that their marriage does not seem maybe like they're really on the same page, like Catelyn and Ned seem to be most of the time. I think we'll get more into Joffrey and and he's got whispering going on in both ears, but who he listens to more. Yep. As we go along, uh, it'll certainly be an interesting topic of discussion, I think, even as we get more into learning about him. Yeah, we should probably move on. So uh, we got to, next we have Bran's second chapter. So we saw Bran earlier uh, in the book already uh, with the invited to his first beheading. We now get a, a little bit deeper look into his evolution as a, as a kid and, and who he is and what he enjoys. Uh, so this chapter is, is about Bran. 
he's about to he's about to go to King's Landing with the train with his father, and he's trying to say goodbye, but it's too hard. So he decides he's going to go climb the walls of Winterfell, which is uh, we, we mentioned this a little bit earlier. Is something his mother hates, but it's a it's a real passion for him. He loves doing it. He feels free. He feels better than any, you know. Like he gets a different view of the of the castle and the grounds than anyone else. He's, he's the only one that knows this world and you know climbing and scaling the walls of Winterfell. So he's excited to go and 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 do this, but he's also excited to go to go south. And so he's kind of the saying goodbye thing. He doesn't want to get sad. He wants to be excited. So he's he's climbing to a normally abandoned area. And he overhears a conversation, got some interesting details about his father, but he can't he can't see who it is. So he decides he's got to learn more and see who's doing the talking. Um, you know, that's a risk. He could just leave. He could just turn around and go. But he, he, he wants to see who it is and thinks he has to. Um, he sees that it is, in fact, Cersei Lannister and her twin, Jamie Lannister. And Jamie Lannister is doing his best color me bad impression. Um, <laughs> and... Um, while Bran kind of peers back down over the edge, he slips and is falling, and Jamie catches him. No sooner than catching him, Jamie looks. Quick discussion with Cersei, and they decide they're going to throw him out the window. Jamie pushes him out the window, falling far to the ground below Winterfell. And that is how the chapter ends, with Bran falling from the window. Oh, you got to give the line that Jamie uh, Jamie says. Say. End it with the line. <laughs> well, yeah. we started the episode with the line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this line is the title of this episode, The Things I Do for Love. Oh! <laughs> and an uh, <laughs> It's an interesting line. I mean, it's... Uh, we're on it. Let's talk about it. So, uh, The Things I Do for Love. So he's in love with his twin. That's the first thing we, we glean from that. Uh, no, he was just hurting her. Remember what Bran said? wrestling and hurting her because she was yes. telling him to stop. We mm-hmm. all we all know how that goes, I'm sure. It's also kind of a casual line, the things I do for love. It's the almost like I a do. sarcastic thing you'd say when you know, when you when you do something unimportant. It's kind of like a, a little throwaway, oh the things I do for love sigh. And he's done something pretty severe. But it's just kind of a throwaway, and I think that I think that's an interesting look into Jamie's character as well. Um Our first real look into him yes. is having sexual relations with his twin and then pushing a child out of a window. But also and a few smaller nuggets too, during that chapter about Jamie, you know, Cersei's very, Cersei's very worried about the situation with Ned coming South and what it means and what his intentions are. Jamie's like, dude, relax. Chill. I'm trying to get off here. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like he's, he's just not, he's just not that interested in all this politics stuff. And it, it does. It just comes off very casual. It's like, I'm not sure you can afford to be casual about all this stuff. So yeah. uh, a very interesting first look at Jamie. I feel like George kind of wrote him sort of like um, like your your typical action movie uh, star. Sort of almost like a John McClane. It's like, oh, here we go again. And like throwing <laughs> out one-liners. <laughs> yeah. And calming hysterical women. When Cersei saw Bran, she started screaming. He's just like, oh, I better catch this kid. <laughs> Uh, which which i really enjoy um i it is no secret that i love jamie i think he's an excellent character despite the fact that he kills children and uh sleeps with his sister which you know scientific fact we are all attracted because of our inherent narcissism to features that resemble our own so it's not like a huge surprise that they're sleeping together it's still pretty taboo but um, I kind of get it. They're both they're both hot. Still, very probably very unhealthy and damaging for their for their brother sister relationship. Yeah. Well, um, damaging or helpful? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no. You know what? Good point. Good point. It sounds helpful. It sounds like they have had each other since birth. Um, you know, uh, probably Cersei sees, sees her marriage to Robert as a hardship and having Jamie there to get her through it has been a great support system. Um, again, only from her perspective, <laughs> anyone else's perspective. Oh boy. <laughs> it's, also, it's also interesting too. I mean, we're, uh, I don't know, what are we, seven, eight, eight chapters into this thing. And we're already dealing with our second case of incest, incest. In, in this world. 
and mm -hmm. we've we've learned that we've learned that it's it's almost okay for the Targaryen family that that they did that as a way to uh, keep it in the family, literally, right? And you know, maintain their their pure status in in their family, right? And, and not not spread it around. Uh, but, but this is a little bit different. You you get uh, you get you got some impression, I think, in the early chapter that it was okay for the Targaryens and not everyone else. And we're seeing here it's happening somewhere else, and I don't know. I don't know if we know exactly how to react to it, right? Well, George is throwing it in for shock value, like like a lot of his plot devices, whether it be um, zombies or beheadings that get watched by children, or I, I don't want to give away any other shock value moments that we're going to have, but it's deliciously taboo, and we just eat that kind of stuff up, right? And, uh, well, we know one I, of us does. <laughs> it is. No, it, it makes for re it makes for super interesting reading because it brings a whole new dynamic to well, one their relationship and to every other interaction they have with every Tyrion's chapter. Him and Jamie are quite close. Uh, Jamie treats him, you know, like he would uh, any other sibling. Uh, <laughs> not any other sibling. <laughs> <laughs> he, tre <laughs> he treats him like um uh like he he definitely sees past uh Tyrion's dwarfism um and other uh disfigurements and uh sees him for the the clever brother that he is and and values him as a clever brother that he is would Tyrion accept and and and, and cherish that uh Jamie's admiration for him if he knew that you know Jamie and Cersei were dutying knocking boots let's not also forget that we find out in this chapter that jamie along with all the other things he's done like pushing kids out of windows and stuff has also killed a king uh mm. while being a member of the king's you know royal bodyguard yes his nickname is the king slayer yes yeah and as a result people kind of they talk behind his back it seems like they kind of don't take him as seriously i mean bran is one of the things that we haven't talked about in this chapter is is the qualities of Bran, but Bran immediately looks down on him. He discounts him as, as a member of, of the, uh, the King's guard. There's two of them that came, not three, right? Mm -hmm. He almost mm -hmm. doesn't even count them. He and, doesn't. Which, which is also interesting. Uh, in the previous chapter with John, there's a note, uh, where John is saying, this is what a King should look like. And he's referring to, to Jamie, to right? Jamie. And, and so that, that's an interesting, uh, um, disparity there. You know how these guys see him. <clears throat> Some interesting stuff with with Bran too. Just um, this kid is a he's a dreamer, you know. He's a dreamer. He's a high flyer. He wants to be he wants to be the best thing in the world. He wants to go south. He wants to learn about the court. He wants to be a legend. He wants to be a knight. He wants to do all these great things. And you know, at the same time. I get the feeling that he's kind of a little bit of a loner. One of his one of his favorite things to do is go climb and be by himself. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not sure what that says about him, but it's it's kind of interesting, right? He, I, I feel it, like he's got these qualities that are very knight like. This quest for adventure, this uh, the 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 willingness to to endanger himself by learning who's doing the talking in this scene that we've been you know going through, and at, at, at great risk to himself potentially, right? You know, let's throw out child childlike curiosity from it and assume that it was, it was some, you know, some real noble quality that made him feel like he needed to do that, and he followed through, and he's seven. You know, hey, he even he even says in there that if he if he didn't look, then when he went to tell his parents, they wouldn't believe him, and yeah. so he he felt like he had to. Well. Uh... I think you described him really, really well, but also in Caitlin's chapter uh, where they are discussing who will stay at Winterfell and who will go down to King's Landing with Ned, um, she gets the most emotional over Bran leaving. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to find where she does talk about him. It's not worth me looking it up, but she loves him. She thinks he's just excellent. Just, he's just the opposite a... of John in her eyes. Yes, yes, such a such a sweet, loving boy, and it's almost you, know, you look back at that line, and you're like, oh, probably completely undeserving of being thrown from a tower. And he was the main topic of conversation in the Godswood in Catelyn's first chapter too, before they mm. started talking about other things. You're right. Yeah, little Bran getting up to no good, climbing everywhere. 
She likes she likes her brand. So uh, we're getting short on time. I think we should we should move on to uh, to Tyrion's chapter. All right. So Tyrion's chapter. Uh, this is his first chapter. Um, another character I just love. Thank you for picking uh, awesome character chapter summaries for me, Matt. Really I did that on it. purpose. Yeah, also screw you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh Tyrion wakes up um the next day after Bran falls from the tower. It's quite early in the morning, but there are already people gathered in the courtyard getting ready to train again with swords and he sees um um Joffrey. God, I can't why can't I remember his name? And you know what? I apologize. It might not be the next morning. It might be a couple of days later because he gets very irate with Joffrey because Joffrey has not gone to pay his respects uh, at Bran's bedside to Catelyn and Ned. Tyrion, who I believe is completely in the right, is shocked and appalled that Joffrey has not already done this, that he's being a little um, whiner about the fact that Bran's wolf, who still doesn't have a name, has been howling outside of his window ever since um, they brought Bran back to the tower. Um, uh, P.S. Uh, we learned that his spine and legs were shattered from the fall, and he is unconscious at this time. Catelyn is by his bedside. So uh, Joffrey sasses him back, and Tyrion slaps him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, more than that, Tyrion threatens to slap him uh, if Joffrey says one more word. Joffrey says one more word, and that's when the slap happens. And I love <laughs> it when people follow through with threats. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> so the um, bloodlust is back. <laughs> It is also my lust for strong parenting. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's very interesting because Joffrey is prince, heir to the throne. Tyrion, well, his uncle is still um, nowhere near inheriting any sort of throne. Um, and also a dwarf. And also, um, as we keep on hearing from George, quite ugly and disfigured. Um, and, it, and it's interesting to me that Joffrey would still have enough respect for him to take the slap and then go pay his respects at Bran's bedside. He actually listens to Tyrion. I think that's something that we should discuss. But first, uh, Tyrion, uh, exhausted from his little slap fest, goes to find breakfast. Um, uh, the mood is is quite sour in uh, Winterfell. They've put off going back down south um, for a while, um, at least until Bran wakes up. So it's cold and and um, Tyrion is very observant that uh, things are not going well uh, up here in the north. Anyways, he goes in to get breakfast. Great description of food. Uh, Scott, you mentioned earlier that you would love to have lived in this universe just to eat. And I completely agree. So much like wholesome comfort food and, and natural few ingredients and gravies and creams and beers and very tasty. Oh, but Benjamin taking that bite out of the onion in John's chapter. That oh, delicious. delicious. Oh, gross. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, so good. I love onions. No, I didn't need that. Presumably it was like like caramelized, I'm guessing. Anyways. Still gross. Whatever the, delicious. Whatever the case, when he gets to the breakfast room, um, Cersei and Tommen and um, Marcella, her children are there, as well as Jamie, And right away he senses that something is off and he engages them in conversation and, and watches them exchange a look uh, as they're discussing uh, Bran's uh, current state and the fact that Maester Lewin thinks that he might wake up because he hasn't gotten any worse. And uh, Cersei and Jamie exchange a look like they might be worried about this seven-year-old kid waking up. Like, why should they care? And, Interestingly, Tyrion is suspicious of them and suspicious of the fact that they might have had something to do with Bran's fall. And uh, yeah, that's where we leave off. It was a pretty short chapter. One of the things I love about about that is that whole part of the table is he's not he's not leading a line of inquiry. He lets the kids natural curiosity ask him questions, then mm -hmm. his then uses his answers to watch the responses around the table. And it's he brilliant. observes more than he talks. Yeah, he? and 
yeah, and he's very he's very casual in the way he delivers the messages, yeah. and he's not like I'm here to tell you things. The kids ask him stuff, and he responds. It's, you know, it's very it's very unassuming way of going about it. He conducts the conversation mm, while yes. not actually leading it. It's if that makes sense. It's very interesting. I don't get music, so no, it didn't make sense. <laughs> Tyrion, uh, super intelligence, uh, super manipulative, and uh, as you as you noted, super observant. Uh, definitely knows when to keep his mouth shut and just listen. Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. We also, I, I don't. I, we, you, you mentioned a little bit at the very very beginning, but it goes to the intelligent thing. But this chapter starts with Tyrion in a library reading a book, and he's been there all night. The Septon that's in there with him fell asleep, passed out. But Tyrion's been in there all night reading, reading, reading a book, and uh, th- what, it's it's just almost a throwaway line. But it it says something interesting that you could maybe guess about this world. But uh, he says to the Septon as he's as he's leaving something about you know your copy of this book is the only complete version I've ever seen. You need to take care of it, and it's it's too it's it's interesting for two reasons to me. Uh, it it just speaks to. Tyrion's love of knowledge and how important he thinks it is that he's going to mention it to this guy that fell asleep on the book on the way out. And and B, just the fact that this is an, era, an age where knowledge transfer is not easily done. There isn't – there aren't books and, and massive copies of books just laying around. If you get a copy of something and have a chance to read it, you should take that chance because you may never see that copy of that book, a copy of that book again. And so Tyrion absorbs that kind of stuff and, and stays up full nights doing it when he finds a new library. I know, Brooke, you mentioned you wanted to talk maybe a little bit about Joff's relationship with Tyrion. We got a couple minutes if you wanted to. or um, Yeah, you know what? I, I would actually put this question to you guys. Um, why did Joffrey listen to him? Why, why was Joffrey actually cowed by the slap? I, I would think just from his past behavior, his behavior to everybody else, that he would not have taken that from his uncle, so especially his uncle, who's a dwarf, mm-hmm. and is of obviously, you know, a lower social standing in the eyes of everybody else uh, on the outside. Certainly not on his inside, um, as we can see from his intellect and, and stuff. But uh, I agree, and I'm puzzled by it. Actually, I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts. Um, well, I'll give mine. Please. <laughs> of course, Scott has some thoughts. <laughs> I think Joffrey's a little bitch. He is. I, I, no, honestly, I think that's what it comes down to in this case. He's sadly physically intimidated by a dwarf that flaps him around. He's somewhat cowardly and doesn't have doesn't have the ability to stand up for himself in this way. He's just afraid and, and all talk. Let me ask you this. What if Jamie had slapped him? Well, I think Jamie looking at him would have been enough for him to go talk to the talk <laughs> Yeah, to the no kidding. That would have been devastating. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is part of the of Tyrion's way of just being. Um, first of all, no one else would have dared to slap him, probably, just because he's a prince. Tyrion doesn't yeah. care. He does slap him, and, and that takes him back. And, and he's exactly what you said he is, Scott. So, But you're right. He's it's a little bit of a that. surprise, right? When you're taken by yep. surprise like that, you're like, oh, what? Oh, I, I've never been. To do this? You, maybe, I sh- maybe he's right. Maybe I should go. Yeah, yeah, or maybe he's not even thinking at that point. He just doesn't even know what to do. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is also our first introduction, really, our, our our second introduction, but a closer look at the Hound, uh, who is Sandor Clagan, and as we understand it, he is the assigned personal bodyguard to Joffrey. Uh, he is recognizable because half of his face has been burned, and uh, he um, is a little bit spicy. He uh, did uh, after after uh, Joffrey slunk off. Uh, the Hound mentions to Tyrion, and you're not really sure what kind of relationship they have yet. That Joffrey is not going to take that forever, and uh, Tyrion doesn't really give a shit. But uh, it does tell us that the Hound understands what a little shit Joffrey is. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Going, and oh, how he's going to grow and sorry, you're right, it is very interesting how he's going to grow into a very inno- uh, like just a jerk of a man. 
he he doesn't you know if he is he is Joffrey's assigned protector, and you almost expect him to get right up in Tyrion's face, be like, "If you ever touch that kid again, I swear." And yeah. he just kind of says, "He's not going to forget that." Just so you know, almost giving <laughs> advice to Tyrion, almost warning him a little bit. And then Tyrion says, uh, "You know, if he does forget, he says something like, be a good dog and remind him.'" And then he says, hey, "Where can I find my family?" And Clegane tells him, <laughs> and Tyrion goes off like. You're uh, right. I never thought about that. He should have defended Joffrey and 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 at least gotten upset or or come to his aid or stepped in front of the slap or or caught Tyrion's hand. But not, <laughs> one, he let it happen. Should, Two, he was yeah. probably smiling. And he let it happen again, right? <laughs> yeah. There should never even have been a second slap. Yeah. So uh, obviously, he's going to keep Joffrey from serious, like mortal peril. Uh, likely because if he doesn't, he too will die. But he has no problem with Joffrey being chastised and uh, probably wants to do it quite often himself. Probably. Don't All right. Know. Should, should we, uh, we're, we're about at our mark. Do we... Davos after dark. Okay. Well, I will throw this out to you guys and see which um, makes you salivate more. Do we want to, uh, so everyone uh, else who's listening, <laughs> turn it off now if you want to avoid any spoilers uh, we're doing our feature called Davos After Dark which is completely open to any sort of spoiler that you want to talk about turn this off now okay Davos After Dark dun, 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 dun. Davos After Dark Davos After yeah. Dark <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so, so what were your what were your two nuggets what what makes you salivate more uh, talking about who John's parents are or the foreshadowing that we get of Bran in that first chapter as to Talk- what he's going to become. Talking about Jon's parents, I could actually not contribute to the conversation when you guys were talking about the like the the parentage of of Jon Snow and who his mother was. Because I was like, no, I'll, I'll give it away. Right. Like, yeah, it was a tough one to walk. <laughs> yeah. That isn't his father. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it was a little tough to walk. Uh, we don't know that. Right. I'll just, I'll just devil's advocate. We he don't could know. be. Could be. We, we do get confirmation from John from Ned that John is of his blood. Yes. So he's some relation. I, I will throw out. Just I mean, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. All three of us subscribe, I think, to the the R plus L equals J theory. Which, uh, if you don't know what that is, it's. Uh, Rhaegar plus Lyanna equals John, uh, and that the Ned is not his father at all. Um, but but I do want to just talk, focus on the Ashara Dane thing for a minute because that to me doesn't make any sense. The theory the theory is as explained by Catelyn in that chapter is that Ned goes to the Tower of Joy has the has the fight right and and uh, kills oh, the Kingsguard the Kingsguard member that's Ashara Ashara's brother Gerald da- no Gerald Hightower Arthur. and Arthur Dane sorry gosh. Kills Arthur Dane along with, you know, along with the rest of the King's Guard that are there with Lyanna, and goes all the way to Starfall where Ar- Ashara and, and Arthur are from, uh, and delivers his sword, the Sword of the Morning, uh, to his sister Ashara. And the theory is that that is where Ned slept with Ashara and 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 gave and she then gave birth to John. So I, I just don't I don't understand the timeline because. He's going there to return a sword. He's got to get back to his wife. The war is over. He's got other pressing matters, and he's going to stick around for for nine months to wait for this kid to be born. I just don't. I don't like. There would be questions right. being asked. Like, dude, what are you doing down Why there? Why are you still here? <laughs> like, you've got a son. Come home, or like, uh, you know, Robert saying, "Hey, I need my warden in the north to get back and settle things up up there." You know, I mean, I just don't. I don't understand how he would stay there for nine months. Well, there is the possibility that he met up with Ashara before, went off, fought everything. Then when he brought the sword back to Starfall, he found out he was a daddy. Yeah, or but none of that is true. Pretty unlikely. Oh, I... Play along for a minute. <laughs> no, I no, I, I, I honestly, you know. The evidence is overwhelming. Yeah, when you're, when you're like on a plane and there's a little bit of turbulence, and you get that rush of adrenaline, you think, oh, this is it. And, you know, your 
you should have thoughts of your family and loved ones running through your head or maybe your cats. You know what I think about? I'll never find out. <laughs> you sound pretty damn sure of yourself. Why are you waiting to find out? <laughs> should we do a quick no. review of, 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 this, this, is, of this theory? What, my point is, Scott, is this is what I'm living for is confirmation. <laughs> right. Right. That John is Leanna and Rager's son. Well, that's what I'm trying to give to you. I'm just trying to walk you guys through it. Right. So from a timeline perspective, when it just doesn't make sense. Well, I don't know. Maybe it does. You said you said I've 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 heard this a, a version of this theory before. I think that he saw her somewhere else, slept with her, and and they had sex then. So it's like the middle of wartime. Yeah, I guess dudes sleep with chicks in the middle of war sometimes, like after battles or whatever. But it doesn't seem like Ned's style. Yeah. There was a there was a little nugget I think in that story that Mira Reed tell, tells Bran I think it's in that story where she mentions that Ned and Ashar were making eyes at each other at a tournament at Harrenhal. Yeah, but what's um, the timeline? But that was that that's what she's just about to say. It's like a year or two before even Robert's Rebellion. Yeah. So, mm. but I mean, you know, the evidence is to me is fairly overwhelming when you look at some of the motives and stuff that that they did things. You know. Uh, just to back up just two steps for those that aren't familiar with the theory, uh, is that Rhaegar Targaryen, um, the the heir to the throne, was already married to a Martell, and he uh, went off and he was truly in love with Lyanna Stark. And the way that Robert tells it, of course, is that Rhaegar kidnapped Lyanna, raped her and all that stuff or whatever he did, and uh, and that's how Robert's Rebellion started. But the idea is that they actually were in love, Rhaegar and Lyanna, and that's how we got Jon Snow. Uh, you know, just the whole idea of... It could be kids... either way, really, to be honest. Right. They could have been in love or it could have been rape. Either way, you it could, could have, have ended up with Jon. But yes. anyway, go the, for it. It starts with me at some of the motives of Rhaegar's motives. What's, what's the point of the Kingsguard? To protect the royal line. Right, and there's only so many Kingsguard at a time. What there's like six, seven, eight, eight. Damn, we <laughs> three <suck>. different answers. <laughs> so, three of your Kingsguard, three, almost half. It is half if you take my number, but <laughs> I won't. Almost half of your Kingsguard, you are going to post at the Tower of Joy to watch this girl you kidnapped. That just yeah. seems really unlikely to me. Well. How about to asking... me, I see he's he's protecting his royal line, knowing that his son will be heir if he dies. How about the fact that Ares is the one that should be making all these decisions? I think they were done with Ares. I think everyone knew he's a psycho. So th- th- you're so well. So, so I'm just setting up a premise here. Uh, the premise is that the king's guard doesn't care what Ares says because mm-hmm. he's crazy and he's going to be gone soon somehow, somewhere mm-hmm. or another. So we'll do, you know, what we want. Well, right. if they're willing to do what they want, then they're probably willing to disobey any sort of rules about having to protect the king line. They could do whatever they want. Mm. If you're disobeying orders, you're disobeying orders. It's like the, sure. uh, well, to draw a parallel, it's like the Night's Watch guy. The what 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 Ned says about the Night's Watch guy leaving. He's like, well, his life is forfeit. So at this point, he's willing to do whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. They're disobeying orders. They might as well disobey all the orders. To the death, though. I don't know. That's interesting. For the record, especially Scott... like the best. The, Arthur Dane was seen as like one of the best knights ever. Yeah. So post him at the tower. So you'd have thought Rhaegar would have wanted him in battle to maybe kill Robert. Yeah. And he posts him to watch his girl that he kidnapped. I don't know. That's Seems a like argument. a waste of resources to me. <clears throat> there, there are seven Kingsguard. Ah! Scott, Scott was right. Scott is correct. Uh, another thing is is we get like we get tons of little uh, glimpses in the house of the undying where Danny sees a chink in the wall in a large wall and in that chink is a blue flower and the uh, uh, the the crown that Rhaegar gave Lyanna at the tournament that he won when he crowned her queen of love and beauty was made of blue flowers and apparently they were notorious to. They were notoriously Liana's favorite type of flower. And they were all over the bed when she died, too. Yes, yes. And Danny saw that chink in the in the wall, of a wall of ice with uh, with that flower, indicating Jon Snow being at the wall at that time. Wow. Did you observe that yourself, or did you read that theory online? 
Read it online. Okay, I just want to even even so even just remembering it is amazing. I could hardly make it through that chapter of Danny. Oh my god, I was gonna say the same thing. Oh, I was like, you read all that, Matt? I yeah. think I, I think I remember. Some, I was like, oh, wall, Jon Snow, or something like that. But the flower thing, I had to be led to that. Yeah. Even even so, yeah, interesting theory, and also I love that it backs up my my own personal beliefs. Oh. And and I just, you dude, know what? I am totally on board for Jon Snow and Danny getting let's, together let's and just, let's just, ruling. Let's, let's just save a few things. Let's just <laughs> slow our roll a little bit. Um, the second episode, we're already going into R and L plus J or R hey, plus L equals J. Now you want to discuss this every episode. <laughs> let's just have a segment on R plus L equals J and and see where it takes us can it can one of the can one of the segments in the end just be brooke drawing hearts uh with with uh john and danny and uh yes throw a little Tyrion in there yeah samaria yeah. brianne oh it's also great yeah i i wanted to say when i saw your chapter summaries proposals like i'm not gonna bitch but i'd much <laughs> rather have Arya and Tyrion. I'm sorry. Uh, I punched air. I was so happy. <laughs> uh, I will admit, I saw in in uh, email Brooke mentioned how much she loved Tyrion's chapters, so I did make it work that way. But uh, I'm sorry, fine. Scott. We don't need to waste call time on this, right? My feelings are hurt. Uh, Let's leave it at that. Said it that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, really excited, though, to get into more of these characters. I can't wait to discuss Jamie more. Uh, I talk about Braun a lot, but Jamie is my all time favorite character in the stories. Some really rich stuff we're going to be getting into soon. Jamie's your favorite. Brooke, who's your favorite? Mm, yes, you have to pick one. John Snow. All right. Scatty. Yeah, I, I think my favorite is Arya, uh, but I, 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 did, I did feel quite bored with her latest arc in the last couple books. Mm. But it's, I think she, I think she is my favorite character, though. Yeah. Um, I thought yours was going to be Robert Baratheon. I do love I do love Big Bobby B. He's like he's like what Braun is to me. Baratheon is to you, I think. Yeah, I love I love Baratheon. He's just a big meathead, great right. warrior. Not not a lot of thinking going on. Just kind of plot around and knock people's knock people's limbs off with his club. It's awesome. Oh, I totally envy that kind of ambition where you see something, you want it, you take you it. it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Brooke, Brooke, who's your um, Robert Baratheon or Braun? Ooh, I was trying to think of that. Uh, the character that you just you just like just because they are them. It's got to be Tyrion. I, he just delights me endlessly. I, I love the way he thinks, and I guess by logic, the way that George thinks. Like mm. it, again, it's amazing to me that that George can like dampen and heighten the intellectual dialogue and monologue of of each point of view as needed. Yeah, he can be a child, he can be an older person, he can be um, a, a person prejudiced against, he can be super smart, he can be yeah. Anyway, it's amazing, fantastic. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this podcast. Indeed. Yay, George. Well, let's let's finish it. So next time, be sure to join us and look through the next chapters that we will be reading, which are John's second chapter, Danny's second chapter, Ned's second chapter, Tyrion's second chapter, and Catelyn's third chapter. And Tons of fun. Yeah. Let's do All it. right. Yeah. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thanks for listening, everybody. Always Great a good combo. time. Yep. Have a good night. Bye.